John was enjoying a welcome mid-morning break when he was the victim of a vicious street crime. It cost him several thousand pounds, but it wasn't until the next day he realized the enormity of it. All he can recall is responding to a text from what he thought was his bank, urgently asking him to verify his security details. Moments later, he'd been robbed in broad daylight. You can't see cybercrime, but there are ways to avoid it. At Barclays, we'll never ask you to verify your security details by text. This is a global original podcast. Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project that I've described in the introduction to every episode so far, so I won't bother going through the motions again. I'm delighted to tell you that this week's guest is Owen Jones, who, well, it's a bit of a cliche, Owen, but you don't really need much of an introduction, mm. do you? I don't know how to... God, oh, can we swear? I was going to swear already from the from the bat, but maybe I won't. No, absolutely. Gob, S-H-I-T-E. There we go. Is that, is that my name? Uh, and um, this being a, an interview that goes through the life and times before arriving, sometimes somewhat belatedly, in the here and now, um, we should probably say in advance, we could probably do two of these. We could do the traditional full disclosure, and then I'm sure we'd have plenty to fill another hour just talking about the state of... The nation and left-wing politics in particular, but let's... So two traumas. Two, yes, <laughs> just, isn't it? Um, let's begin at the beginning, and, and that is in, in Sheffield in South Yorkshire, although I always think of you as being more a son of Stockport than a son of the steel works. I am, you know what, though, it's funny, because my mum used to have this really embarrassing description on her website where she said that she had four kids and they all had Made in Sheffield stamped on their belly buttons. <laughs> uh, I told her to change that in case... To, anyway, um, yeah, I was born in Sheffield, so I'm, I'm a plastic Yorkshireman. But then, uh, then via Falkirk, I went through all the scenic parts of the country, lived there for two years, but I grew up in Stockport, yeah, so across the Pennines, so I'm now a plastic mank. Well, I mean, looking at your parents' backgrounds, it's, it's fair to say that you didn't rebel politically against the, uh, against the abiding... <laughs> Themes and values at home as a, as, as a young man. But but before we get on to that, t- tell me a little bit about school. Um, it's blimey, what would I say about school? Um, I mean, I went to my local... I grew, I went to comps in Stockport. Um, and I don't know, what do I say about school? What do you even say about like school? It? Did I like school? Were you um, happy there? Were you popular? I had lots of friends. Uh, I still have friends from from being at school in Stockport. By the end of high school, I found it very suffocating. And I remember by that point, um, I'd like bleached my hair. What a cliche. I looked like um, the Judder Man. Do you remember that? The uh, Or the singer of Lincoln Park. Yes. Just blonde, okay. spiky yes. hair. And I, you know, pierced my ear and had an eyebrow piercing. And I remember I was sent to, it was called upper school office, and they, a load of teachers just were like, your hair's too spiky, you're wearing the wrong shirt, sort your shoes out. And they were like spinning me around. So I found it very suffocating by the end. And I started, by the end of high school, I was just skiving off. I was just fed up. Sixth form, I found very liberating. I went to the biggest sixth form in the country, as it then was. And it was just suddenly being able to just, you know, you know, you, you were given freedom. You could, you know, you could, uh, you were you were treated more like a grown-up. So I found that kind of, and a lot of my, you know, again, I have lifelong friends from that time. And I think that's the period you kind of become, start to become who you are for the rest of your life, for, good, for good or for ill. The most formative period. So were you not political or particularly engaged prior to sixth form? Uh, do you know, I wasn't particular. Well, I was always, yeah, I mean, I always saw myself as very political, but a lot of my friends, ne- they weren't political at all. Um, I've always been very lucky that my friends often aren't political because yeah. you end up otherwise, I think, just so much in a bubble. And I don't want to be harsh, but a lot of <laughs> politics can be partly explained by people who kind of at the age of 12 in front of a bathroom mirror pretending to do like conference speeches and seeing themselves as politicians the next number of years and just surrounding themselves with other people like that. You know, at university it was the same, I kept well away from student politics. It, it, I hated and it was it. one of the few things that I endeared me to David Cameron was that he made a big song and dance about not having got involved in student politics. Oh, I remember going once going to the Oxford University Labour Club. Um, I'm trying to think if there were any MPs from that time. I should be careful. But Probably. I mean, I did go to school. I mean, at that university, I know, you know, conservative and mm. he certainly, I hated it. I saw, I just, it just, the hackery, I don't quote Henry Kissinger much because he's a, 
war criminal. <laughs> um, but I think he said, like, student politics is so vicious because the stakes are so low or something. I mean, it was just, you know, often, you know, just attracted a certain type of person who, you know, I thought would just sell them on eBay to get a parliamentary seat. Really vicious, not really believing very much. I mean, it was that period. You know, when I was at university, it was during the Iraq war. So a lot of people... You know, you know, there's tuition fees as well. If you were young and idealistic, why would you go near the Labour Party at that time? Were you in sixth form? Were you already, when you got there, someone who might have been aiming for Oxbridge? I mean, did you did you come no. out? Of- oh my word, no! I don't want to sound really naive because I'm not a working class hero. I grew up with my in a working class community, but my parents, you know, my mum, my, my dad was a well, he was a, he was a local authority worker and lost his job. My my mum was an IT lecturer at Salford University, so I, you know, a lot of my friends regarded me as posh. Yes, compared to their, you know, they grew up with supermarket worker, uh, teaching assistants, uh, primary school t- teaching assistants, people, you know, working class jobs. But um, uh, Oxbridge to me was like a di- it was like a different universe. I thought Oxbridge was a place because I think I got confused with Oxbridge and I was confused by University Challenge. Imagine if you'd ended up at college in well, Oxbridge. I wouldn't have, have, would have been, had a nothing great time. Nothing wrong with Oxbridge. Uh, <laughs> nothing wrong with, apart from the local MP, uh, <laughs> Boris Johnson. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I remember... Um, yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I seen University Challenge with the different colleges and I thought they were separate from the university. Mm. And when I went there for an interview, which is the first time I ever went to Oxford University, and what happened was is they got someone who'd been to our sixth form and it was a huge sixth form. It was often very vocational. A lot of people there were aspiring footballers. They had this football for life scheme. A lot of people did health and social care. It was very vocational. A lot of older people, the oldest person in my French class was 83, called Beryl. Very, um, so it, was very, it wasn't a stand, you know, it was a very big sixth form catering for the local community. And they brought in someone who'd used to go, go there. And the whole point was to try and not make us feel off put, uh, you know, find yeah. it off putting. Because all our questions were, are they basically a bunch of inbred posh people? Let's just, that's, that's the questions we asked. Um, and the, our sixth form teachers, their position was, you might as well go for it for a bit of a laugh. And the worst thing they did, I love them, but the, bless them, they tried giving me a mock Oxford exam, which was, why are you applying for Oxford? Yeah. What are your hobbies? And then you turn up, and then suddenly getting ripped apart by these lectures, it wasn't good preparation. But when we went there, uh, we hated it. All the people from my sixth form, we just hated everything about it. And I remember we were in the Mitre pub in Oxford, and, we're, and we were going through song lyrics to describe how we felt about being in Oxford. And one, you know, it was like, in the words of Tom York, I don't belong here. <laughs> Hated it. it. It felt like Harry Potter, Tales. You know, I'd never met anyone from a private school before. And by the way, I should say, without doing some of my best friends are, that changed. <laughs> I've, I've got great friends from uh, Oxford who went from a variety of backgrounds. But it was a culture shock because, uh, you know, if you go to a comprehensive in the North, even if you're not, you know, some working class hero, which I'm not, mm. and have never pretended to be. It felt like going into a completely different universe. It was, it was, you know. But I loved loads of it. I mean, I was, you know, you d- you do take to it. But it was there were elements of it where you met people who had only ever known privilege and never known anyone outside of that, and just simply did not understand what it was like uh, to be from outside of that bubble. And that had a big, it, it, as much growing up with people in in poverty. More people from my primary school went to prison than sixth form, let alone university. Gosh. In my class, I think I was the only boy in my class to go to university from my primary school. Um, as, mu- as much as that educated me, growing up with people who wore school uniform at, um, at the weekend because they didn't have yeah. clothes, growing uh, or equally going to Oxford and meeting people who were very cosseted and privileged and not having much self-reflection about it How made me would, think about class. Ah, uh, uh, what, for the first time in that sort of depth? Definitely, I mean... Uh, because how? So this might sound like a daft question, but how would those subjects come up? Because uh, I, I came from the kind of privileged background that you describe, albeit more to do with my school than my family. And my first couple of years at university, I don't think I talked about anything except the really cliched studenty stuff. So how did you... And I wasn't at Oxbridge, I was at LSE, mm-hmm. which might have been a slightly different environment anyway. But how did you end up talking to people in a way that revealed their ignorance about the reality of other people's... Oh, I think, you know, again, my friends were in political universities no. and avoided politics as a general rule in terms of being that involved with politics formally. We did talk about politics. People always spoke... We did talk about politics, of course we did. It often be very casual asides, you know? Right. Um, I mean, people would say stuff to me, which, you know, like, 
uh, oh, the reason people from comps get in is because uh, of quotas. Yeah. And then I whoop their ass as it exam. Sorry, that's very <laughs> arrogant. Um, no, I mean, um, but uh, no, they I would... saw a piece this week from someone saying the reason why so many privately educated people get into Oxbridge is through a form of Darwinism. It's because their parents must be clever because they're so successful well, they can afford private school. I mean, and actually people from comps do better at Oxford on, on average than people from private schools. But, you know, I, they, people would say things about you know, people who grew up in council estates, yeah. um, which, you know, or people who, you know, even sometimes I'd hear people talk about even homeless people in Oxford right. um, in ways which betrayed a very basic lack of empathy. That was not true for lots of people. Was it a lack way. of empathy or just abject ignorance? Or Both. Yeah. Both. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, a lack of understanding and a belief that anyone, if they work hard enough, can do well and... You know, the person he became, I remember, this was a bit of a shock, in my college, the uh, was a, he was elected the president of the JCR, which is the student union for your college, junior common room, is Simon Clark, who is a conservative MP now up in Middlesbrough. Yeah. Um, I think it's fair to say, if you see Simon Clark, he, you know, back then he was already like a 55-year-old Tory cabinet minister in the body of an 18-year-old student. Um but he, you know, and it was just this very grand, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I did not come to Oxford with a very positive view of Tories already. Let me put it that way. But meeting them for the first time, they were, they were. <laughs> it didn't dissuade you from your. Well, they previous. were horrible. Some of them were horrible people. Yeah. I mean, they were really gruesome, horrible. But I mean, one of them, I remember, he stood for a Tory for the Tories in 2017. And I still have messages on my on my phone. Him calling me a left wing f a g g o t. You know uh, um, what what is uh, one what is once a natural and immoral will always be unnatural and immoral, as he put it. I shared those um, messages on on social media. They haven't revealed who that is, but he stood for conservative office. And and I'm not saying all conservatives oh, are like that, but I met enough younger conservatives who were the most obnoxious and bigoted people I've ever met in my entire life. Are we describing a radicalisation? You know what I think it's with younger Tories is um, because you kind of superficially think, well, Tories aren't doing very well amongst younger people, so the solution is to get young Tories uh, to win them over, but it's yeah. the worst you can do because young Tories define themselves against their own generation. They almost have more yes. contempt for the younger people than anyone else in the country. You know, they're because they're the exception, they feel because they happen not to be representative of where younger people generally are at, that they're somehow being suffocated mm. and, you know, mm. that's where they talk about cancel culture, but they generally just mean, you know, they just... I'd rather not listen to you, pal, thanks. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that means they define... And I think they are often the most right-wing element... It's performative as well. Yeah, it's very... Oh, I remember that as well. I mean, it was the wearing bow ties. Yeah. It was the wearing tweed jackets. It was the bride's head revisited... It was just weird, weird, so weird Reece people. Mogg used to get out of bed at Eton for the national anthem when Radio 4 was shutting down for the night, but that might be apocryphal. It was partly that. And some of the work, again, this sounds, I can only say this because I'm gay. Some of the, the most right wing were gay Tories. Never understood it. Really, really hang and flog them. Do you understand it now? No, it was like a high Tory camp. I couldn't really. Is it? Is it? Can't beat them, join them? Because I wonder about this in the context of ethnicity as well, when some of the most toxic anti-immigration or even anti-refugee positions currently are adopted by politicians whose parents were refugees or who, whose parents were immigrants from the subcontinent. And I, I sometimes wonder if, if we lead the attack on them, then maybe the people who were leading the attacks yesterday will leave us alone. And it might be simply. I think there's so maybe something in that. I think kind of you were over overcompensation. Yes. I mean, I can only speak on behalf of the minority I'm a member of, but yeah, I think overcompensating is definitely part of it. Maybe a sense of as well, is there a kind of... I suppose you could be very anti-collectivism, if you like. Yeah. I'm, you know, as a yeah. gay person, an individual who's kind of being, you know, the homophobia of the mob, maybe. Give your future a silver lining. Turn putting away for a rainy day into investing for a brighter tomorrow. With II's award-winning ISA pension and trading accounts, you can choose how to invest. And our low flat monthly fee means you keep more of what you make. So you might find yourself swapping your umbrella for a sun lounger. Interactive investor. Visit ii.co.uk and open an account today. Capital at risk. We jump forward a little bit. So it was almost a joke when it was suggested that you might apply. 
you must have been producing the goods academically already. Um, what was that process? Talk, talk, I mean, you turned up with your tongue in your cheek? Did you turn up to take the piss or did you? I didn't actually. I, For the interviews? I, I was told that I argued, I, sp- I, I spoke my, uh, I talked my way in, which I'm sure would surprise you, James. Um, I'm very with, <laughs> very withdrawn. I talked my way out. <laughs> I did, seriously. They asked seriously? what Shakespeare play I wanted to talk about. What Shakespeare play are you qualified to talk about? And I can't, I don't think I've ever said this in public. I said all of them. All of them. So then Love they it. just plucked one like Timon of Athens or something like that. And I just had, I just, oh no! I felt my place slipping over the horizon with everything. Oh. Because <laughs> I meant all the big ones. All the, all the bit, that's <laughs> so the Alan Partridge. That's I know, so ridiculous. Probably <laughs> the best of the Beatles. <laughs> um, Sorry, it's about you, not me. No, no, it's very funny. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember it was very, the, the exam, uh, sorry, not, I didn't do an exam, it was sure. the, the interviews were hardcore and they were nothing that I'd ever prepared for and I wasn't prepared for because the joke, the the the, the interview we were given at my sixth one was like a joke. Mm. Uh, I remember it was just like, uh, the, you know, Professor Hartman von Poggy, uh, po- Hartman Poggy von Stramden, great guy. Yeah. And he was like, Lenin was a German spy. And then I was like, Ugh. no. And then obviously I had to make an argument about why Lenin was into German spy. But it was just a very, you know, random. Did you, you love it though? Did you feel juices flowing that we, we, yeah. refresh parts that had never been previously reached? Definitely, yeah. I mean, you know, what was great about Oxford is, is you know, uh, you know, spending huge amounts of time reading books. I have to say, what I did do is tend to cram at sure. the last. Um, minute. I, I was very bad at doing that. I used to have this terrible habit of um, I had like a different ruse for a tutor. Like I'd, if I hadn't finished it in time, I'd print out uh, half the essay and then I'd use Windings, this gibberish font, just type mm. those, hand it and go, oh, it was a terrible error. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I used to take the mick a bit in that way. But I, yeah, I did, you know, I, I mean, what was weird is when I said about I, I didn't do student politics, I did get elected as the student um, representative for my college to the Oxford University Student Union, but I was so scared. I never stand up and speak because I was too scared to stand up in front of people really? and argue against. All people against. or just those people? Those people, yeah. I mean, because the people who turned, they were such experienced, often debaters. And what I think private education does do is often give people a certain confidence yeah, to. Sure. And I just, at that point, didn't have it. I mean, I don't, yeah, with my it's friends. Not real confidence often. It's just no, you've maybe. learned the tricks to look confident exactly but i mean the idea that i would ever so i remember thinking could i ever get the guts to you know stand up and speak up really and at the time yeah so i'd I'd have thought you were a firebrand at school and at college oh well i was i mean i had very you know i remember going on uh, when i had a girlfriend uh for a year at university and we went to you know the anti-war march uh on the on the uh, 13th of february 2003 so i was you know i would do stuff like that but so I you wouldn't be leading it. You wouldn't be. No, I just you didn't like the one with the loud halo. No, I didn't. Like I didn't like uh, the sort of people attracted to student politics. Yeah, and my enough. friends, I, you know, my, the sorts of friends I had were guys who liked football Having and more sporty, fun. and but who, um, who, you know, I'd go out and get drunk with. I suppose. How, how did it go when you got in? How did it go down at home? Because you, you've got quite a big family, haven't you? You've got a yeah. twin sister and two older brothers. So I'm just interested in uh, how that played. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think my parents were. Uh, yeah, my, I think my dad particularly was very very proud of me. I think uh, I'm oh, sorry, my mum as well. But I think my mum was always concerned. I think she was like this with Parliament too. Is you'll get sucked into the system. Um, I've never always been, you know, very good at making sure I'd never get too big for my boots. And also, you know, I do have a twin sister. And the thing about being a twin is you, you know, you feel often a, a kind of competitive edge. Yes, and we're very. You know, we're very different. My sister's very, very arty. She's doing a PhD in art in Seattle at the moment. Um, so we've got, you know, we're very, very different. I think people expect if you're twins, you're very similar and we're not. And and the key thing, which I think my parents were absolutely right about, is not to make anyone think that they were overly special, you know, just because you go to Oxford um, and not to get carried away with something like Oxford. And I think, you know, they, uh, I think they were probably, you know, the thought of the danger of, of getting sucked into, you know, um, the Oxford bubble, yeah, um, and 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 all the rest of it, and and so I think, yeah, and my friends always kept my, you know, the the best thing about having the best friends you can have are friends who just re- just take the mick out of you, and you will take the mick out of each other, and with Oxford they were like. You know, I think a lot of the like, ooh, gone to Oxford now, have you? But yeah, I mean, they, you know, very supportive, but they never, ever let me get too big for my boots. Um, you must have done well, because you, you, you graduated 
you got your first degree in history, then you did a master's in, in, in US history. Yeah. Two questions then. First, you've referenced your sexuality. Mm -hmm. When did that become clearer? to the point that you wouldn't have had another girlfriend. Yes. <laughs> and, and when did... It's been a while, James. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when did the the other side of, of um, uh, you begin to emerge as well, the, the kind of political um, enthusiast? So I think like a lot of people, I found coming out quite difficult because I think it was a sense of life's a tough gig and as is... And being gay, you know, your life's going to get harder and more complicated. So had you been in denial, subconsciously? Oh, yeah, very much so, yeah. Really? Yeah, I think... Subconsciously? Oh, subconsciously, yeah. yeah. I think, I remember... There was this book, I remember this. It was one of these books, it's kind of like growing up books, where, you know, to tell you, you know, the facts of life. And there was one, this paragraph, I always hung on to it, which said, it's often the case, that's a phase that um, people go through um, of same-sex attraction and they grow out of it. And I just clung on to it like a lifeboat. I was like, because... You know, and I remember another, I remember there was a guy, it does show the impact of things like this. I think it was on some daytime TV show where someone rang in in their 30s who was gay and said how terrified they were about coming out. And then they were like, I'm really happy now and my life's really okay. happy. And that was a life raft as well. Yeah, I just thought, you know, at the time in the 90s, uh, the anti-gay laws were still in place. Um, the British Social Attitude Survey showed until about 98, most people still thought being gay was wrong. Uh, yeah. um, only a minority thought otherwise. Um, we didn't have, because of Section 28, any LGBTQ education in school. Uh, it, it, homophobia was so rampant. And, you know, I'd no doubt take part in it. It was It's an all-encompassing, suffocating presence in, in a playground, back then, certainly in Stockport. Um, yeah, I just did not want to be gay. And I what changed? I mean... Uh, what changed? I don't know. Um, fell in love with a Christian fundamentalist. That did you? Good. Yeah. Full on love. I mean... Yeah, the, yeah. He was, like, he was like my best friend. That's why I went to, you know, the college I went to at Oxford. Was it? Yeah, it was, yeah I mean, it was unfortunate. Um, yeah, and then... Yeah, I, yeah, I found that very hard. And then I... Yeah, and I was just like... You know, I had a girlfriend for a year at university and and just tried to just, you know, I was in denial about it. And then in the end, you know, I started going out with this guy who I met in Manchester who's also at Oxford, um, who at the time I had huge amounts of internalised homophobia. I prided the fact that I didn't have any gay friends and I was always like, even when I came out, I was like, I'm not a gay person, I'm just someone who happens to be gay. I did all yeah. that kind of stuff. And he was like a very like, he was rugby, played rugby, he was rowing captain. So I was almost like, he doesn't count because he's such a manly guy. Uh, yeah, I just, I didn't, I did not, you know, it took me a long time to get over that level of internalised homophobia because now I'll talk about, you know, being queer and, and how important that is. I hate... But then I just didn't... Just did not want to be gay. So I probably am wrong then to have seen these two emergencies as separate. The the, the sexual is political and the political is... Yeah, I mean, you, what I realised, you know, it's interesting watching It's a Sin, um, which yeah. is such a brilliant drama by Rossi T. Davies, because it really does show the damage inflicted on gay people by, by a society which won't accept us for who we are, LGBTQ people, not just gay people. Mm. And, uh, you know, and, and the way that family has to step in and undo the damage. Because, you know, it's this, a, a parents know best for their kids. Well, often they don't. I mean, they don't if if they're homophobic or transphobic or whatever. And then, you know, that, that child is growing up feeling uh, not accepted. And that is why... Um, you know, mental distress is much higher amongst LGBTQ people, as is suicidal ideation, as is uh, um, alcohol and drug abuse. And I grew up, you know, as you get to know more LGBTQ people, you meet more and more people who are scarred by the experience of their parents not accepting them for who they are, whose lives have been really badly damaged, um, you know, who go to drugs in a way, for example, that that causes... You know, it's like a ticking time bomb's been sure. put in them. So, you, yeah, so I look at, you look at that, and if, you know, if you're part of any minority, though the experiences of all minorities are very different, um, of course, you have this sense of, you know, you you can at least have a sense of injustice uh, or, or what it feels like, you know, the damage inflicted by injustice and the need to, to, to struggle for proper acceptance because you see the damage inflicted on yourself but on, on, on other people. Hi, I'm Dr Nikki Kanani, GP and Medical Director of Primary Care in England. COVID-19 is still with us, so it's good that 12 to 15-year-olds can now get a second COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccines give your children the best possible protection against the virus and help to keep them in school. 
Get your 12 to 15-year-old vaccinated 12 weeks after their first dose. Book online or find your nearest walk-in centre at nhs.uk slash COVID vaccination. How did your parents react? Um, I came out on Christmas Eve when I told uh, my twin my, my twin sister I told when I was like younger. I said I was bisexual. I feel sorry for real bisexuals because the bi now gay later thing ruins it for them because uh, people are authentically bisexual. But it feels easier for some to come out sure. that way. But and she, it was Christmas Eve and, and um, I had uh, you know a boyfriend uh, and so I was going to come out and and I told my sister I was going to tell them and I, then I was really scared. So she went, she was like, "Tell them, tell them." So I went, um, "Something I want to." Uh, someone I want you to meet, he's called, which is a very cowardly way to come out. And then my mum... You're, you're always so hard on yourself. No, it's, it's just funny. But my mum malfunctioned, bless her. She was like, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. And she wouldn't stop. She just wouldn't, and my dad was like... And I was like, how do I get out of this situation? And then I just was like, and he went to private school. And they went, no! <laughs> and they were kind of joking, but kind of not. Um, yeah, so they kind of... Yeah, and they were fine about it. They were fine. I think they were taking a back. You know, my dad, he's... he's my you dad's, don't want your son to go through what you've just described. No, exactly. That's the point, I think. Yeah. For, for and they've always been very accepting, um, you know, including my dad, who grew up in a very socially conservative Methodist sure. Welsh, you know, in Merseyside, very, very socially conservative. So I'm sure for him it was a leap, but he was, you know, always very accepting of me and my partners. Um, so it's all linked then, isn't it? Uh, Owen Jones is, a, is a, a, a combination of myriad strands, all of which seem to reach new levels roughly around the time you finished your master's, sort of personally, politically, professionally? Well, before that, I, I worked in a bar in Manchester, in Canal Street, for, for a while. Um, Is it Manto? But, uh, no, actually, but I did meet my f uh, first partner at Manto. Uh, just I establishing some credentials. I know, I was going to say, tape. mate. <laughs> love it. Down with the gays. Um, yeah, no, it was sort of a place called View Bar. I worked there during Manchester Pride. It was a great summer, actually. Um, but I sent my CV into a load of Labour MPs who had voted against the Iraq War. One of them was John McDonnell. Uh, and he got back and said, well, I might have a play, you know, for three mm. days a week. And then, um, yeah, and, and that's how I ended up working. So at this point, would you have said you wanted to be a politician? No. God, so no. what did you want to be? Then? No idea. Okay. No idea. You just thought, I'll do this for now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I felt, you know, I thought about teaching English abroad again, a bit of a cliche probably. But I thought, I, I had a sense of either being an academic, which is why I ended up doing a master's and then abortively a PhD. What was your PhD in? American history, yeah. Okay. So I was, and I was, I inherited, it's interesting from a, my parents, you know, Trotskyists, um, so I'm a right wing shift, and but my dad loved American <laughs> history and culture, like, and that I think people don't often associate that with the left. But it, I grew up in a very pro American, right? A, a, just a real love of American history and culture, and so I, st I think because of my dad, I, you know, I was fascinated. My PhD was how the American right won over working class support because oh, I was wow. always interested. Christ, you were ahead of the game, weren't you? Well, indeed. You started to go That's back, it. do the British equivalent. <laughs> but the point of it for me was, it's because the left often. I thought we were interested in what makes people radical. I was more yes. interested in what makes people conservative. Right, of course. But then, but I worked for John. Uh, abortively, we ran his leadership campaign, me and Andrew Fisher, who later became head of policy into Jeremy Corbyn. We tried to get him on the ballot paper when Tony Blair resigned yeah. and failed. And then we tried again in 2010 uh, when I stopped working for John McDonald. So John is someone I got to, obviously, I worked for for three years at the time. Um, and that was weird, working in Parliament. I met a lot of people then. If I look back at that period... You know, like, I sometimes find it funny when you look at, uh, you know, like Andy Burnham and Yvette Cooper, they were all part of the same set. Yeah. And my set back then in Parliament, people I was close to, were people who have ended up in quite, you know, one of them is one of Keir Starmer's right-hand right. men. Uh, one of them works for Sadiq Khan as one of his main advisors. Another works for another shadow cabinet minister. Um, so I was the lefty, but actually my friends were not from... Uh, in the left of the Labour Party. So sure. the last few years has, has been interesting in the friendship group. Yes, I can imagine. We're, we're probably not going to have time to get onto that, as I did warn in advance. So when did Chavs begin to take shape? And am I right in seeing that as the point at which, and you probably won't like this phrase, but it's non-negotiable, that you began to become a public figure? Yeah, I mean, Chavs was interesting because it got rejected by every publisher going. And a small... I, thought, I don't know where I got the idea that was your PhD thesis. No, 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 no. no. I was, Why I did... did you write it then? What was the thinking behind it? 
Because I was fascinated with class and yeah. I thought you couldn't have left-wing politics without thinking about class and justice. And, and I thought at the time there was a sense that, uh, class, you know, all middle class now, class doesn't really matter. Which is interesting because yeah. now the right... Round, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the right talk about class, everyone talks about class. But So I wrote that because, you know, I thought the left needed to put that at the centre of everything we said and did. And I thought that had been abandoned. Um, and... It got rejected. And then Verso took it on. And then I just remember, I thought, maybe it'll get one review and maybe that'll be the launch pad to maybe write something in the future. And I just remember, it just it went, you know, it got review and, you know, it got... It How quickly did it go bonkers? Oh, very quickly. Did yeah. it really? Yeah. Beyond your wildest dreams kind of bonkers. It was bizarre. It was really surreal because I was like, all of a sudden, all these, you know, it was review after review and they were good, they were good reviews. Mm. Um uh, you know, including in, like, The Times. Um, yeah, I mean, at the time, it was really bewildering. You know, I was suddenly asked then to go on TV and write stuff for newspapers about that, but then they were like, will you come and talk about other stuff? Sure. But it was never my aim. I wasn't thinking I want to be a writer. When I never did, thought about that. When did you start getting recognised in the street? Um, I think, actually, the first time properly was when I had this notorious showdown with David Starkey um, during the riots of 2011. Yes. Um, not long after the book had come out. It was only... Yeah, it was about four months. It was, yeah. So it was three or four months after. And I remember that. I actually didn't... I look back and think that performance wasn't very good. It was um, because I felt very... I didn't expect him to say what he did. And, you know, I, I would I would have handled it very differently, I think. But but that went... So, you know, everyone was just coming up to me in the street after that, going, you know, well done and all that Did kind of stuff. Did you enjoy it? No. Not at all? Uh, I've never... I mean, not... I don't... I think I never... A validation and congratulation rather than recognition. Um, I think it's just not something I've ever wanted. And really? I found that very discombobulating because, not just because particularly in the last few years, as politics has polarised and the far right have made increasing intrusions into my life. Yes. Um, but I never want it. No one who knows me thinks that I ever saw any form of recognition. And I found it very disorientating when that happened. And... I, and actually, not pleasant. You found it unpleasant. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, what's weird is no one ever comes up to me in the street and says something bad. Actually, no, other than it's funny that isn't it? Twitter, never. Twitter luckily oh, is there to keep the ego they'll be, in check. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be telling me. You know, I've had it once. Someone shouting something out of a, of a window in the middle of Chelsea, of all places. Really? Which flies in the face oh, of know, stereotyping. Really... They're probably walking past us all the time, thinking <laughs> yeah, that little. Anchor. Yeah, exactly. But they never <laughs> say it. Yeah, no one ever says it apart from when Tommy Robinson people yeah, congregate. Yeah, a bit of that, but only at the yeah, public events. Exactly when they're outside, they're camped outside. Yeah. You know, houses of parliament. Yeah, I mean, I actually do. What ha I found is like when people sometimes I'm feeling a bit like, oh, it's so miserable. Every mm. the world's, you know, and, and people are like, keep going, keep going. Obviously, that has, you know, it, yes. it does help. But I think just being constant, you know, what I found is, uh, I mean, so with, with Twitter, I'm like, oh, I'm trending. Am I? What have I done this time? Yeah. And now what happens is, is you over so many years, you so you end up getting these factions of people who've become quite obsessed with you, mm. and they they all. I mean, in my case, it's people who are very much firmly on the right, people who are obsessed with trans people in a very negative way and see mm. me this demonic figure. Um, and uh, and then I suppose people who are, you know, on the right of the, the Labour Party and very involved in that. Mm. And then, so then sometimes I'm like, well, I don't even know, you know, I, I can see Which them screaming you, a beast like, yeah. I don't even know what perspective they're from. And, and you know, so the, it just becomes, the, it's the level of obsession some people have and it's very odd when you see people who are clearly obsessed with you because you, you to yourself, I've never changed how I see myself, which is just some random blogger, you know, who hangs out with my mates and mm. just happens to believe in the things they do. So when you see people, you know, who convince themselves you're this evil demonic yes. figure, you're kind of like, well, this is just weird. Well, it know? would be weird if they thought you were the Messiah. That <laughs> it's, that's the thing, isn't it? It's, 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 that level of interest and obsession, is even if it was positive, would be unnerving. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's It's the... It's the someone said it's like an, uh, when you have an anti-fandom, you have people obviously always cheering you on and wishing you well, um, which is, you know, I suppose, useful as mm. a counterbalance. And that's, you know, you know, very important in lots of ways when, when you are, I suppose, being under attack. But when you see people negatively who've just, who've built up this bizarre image in their head of yeah. you and you're like, I, I, I just, sometimes I'm like, come on, you're, are you going to lie on your deathbed thinking, I wish I'd obsessed about Owen Jones a bit more than I, I did? I think they are. Or, or I think that they're going to think it was their great achievement was, was you know, I don't know. I give it thought. 
as you do, but I'd stress that whenever people talk to me about that sort of thing, I'm I'm 100% sincere when I say compared to people like you, I have a walk in the park. And of course, not just on social media, but also on the streets because... I mean, there's no two ways about it. You were you were assaulted in in j- January of uh, no no, no um, this got, August August sorry. 2019. It was August, my birthday. Yeah, I've got the dates of the court case in front of me. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, o- August 2019. Mm-hmm. Someone who turned out to be a an enthusiastic collector of neo-Nazi memorabilia attacked you in the street. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, for me, when that happened, that I I, I mean, I don't want to sound. Well, when that happened, me, my friends, we were like, "This is bad. We knew this was going to happen." It was so inevitable. One day, because that so... sense of a build up of a of a of, of yeah. like a pressure cooker of hatred. Yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, a month, in the months leading up to it, uh, you know, as I said, around Parliament, Tommy Robinson, people kept chasing after me, yeah. and screaming at With me on the television. Phones, sorry, I always, know, or always filming it. Filming. It's because do you know what they do that? Because they get money. Uh, you you become a f- on YouTube, uh, and not just that. But they get people from PayPal and stuff to pay them money, and when they get like a big demonic figure, like we got Owen Jones, right, then yeah. and they're screaming a beast, then the people send. send, send money so you now. become like a financial source of revenue for them. Yeah, I mean you've got that. I you know I got surrounded Trafalgar Square by hundreds of far right activists going Jonesy years of bender like that. Um, it was just like be more original with your homophobia. But and you know they spat down my face, and then they started taking pictures of me in the pub with my friends yeah. and putting them on, so, on social media, going, "We'll come and get you." Ha, uh, that you know, inscribing Hango and Jones, the Guardian paper writer, just to make sure they got the right one, yeah. um, on on a farm gate in Kent, right. um, and then and 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 then just you know you know online. Um, uh, just the level of death threats and threats of violence. So when that happened, it was like, um, it was because they didn't say anything when they attacked me, but we just knew it was a far right attack. It was him and his two friends who got done for, for um, they didn't get, they didn't get done for aggravated mm. assault. He did. Uh, they got suspended sentences. Um, yeah, I mean the trial was so bizarre because he was so pitiful. Honestly, it was so embarrassing. I mean, he, you know, I didn't believe in prison for these because I think it's a waste of time. He's not going to be de-radicalized by it and. He, he was so pathetic. He brought in his best, like his mate who he lived with, and he was asked by the lawyer, it was like, is he, would you say he's trustworthy? And he went, yes, he's so trustworthy that if I had an attractive girlfriend and I went to bed and I left him chatting with her, I would trust him not to sleep with her. And I was like, this is so... <laughs> I was like, that's your baseline of trust. <laughs> they were just so pathetic. You yeah. just looked at it, just, you know. And he was going on about, you know, all the Nazi memorabilia. He had SS flags, Nazi death heads. Oh, I'm just a hoarder. I mean, it's just, you know, you just, it's just a pathetic little... Empathy? Um, interestingly, he's, yeah, I mean, one of his family members got in touch, actually, and, and said how tragic it was watching what had happened to him mm. and pointed out that he was from Irish stock originally. He's mm. called James Healy, so you can hear there's an Irish yeah. tinge to it. Yeah, I mean, you kind of think, how does someone get radicalised and get to that point? Um, I felt more at the time, look, I'm a, you know people get attacked way worse than that sure. and they don't get the coverage and they're often they're not guarding you've made this point very important times. point though yes, yeah of course it you is. get racist attacked people of colour Muslims who get grievously attacked um, so I need to not overdo the you know from that perspective um, kind of well what happened to him you know but mm. yeah you kind of look to yourself how did someone end up getting so radicalised that you know they're, they're hoarding Nazi memorabilia I mean he was a Chelsea football hooligan I'm not saying they're representative of Chelsea fans. Of course. Um, because people are angry about that. Um, but, you know, there is a type of far-right football hooligan that always has been. Um, and he, he was one of them. And he just said he loved violence. It's not a lot you can say in response to that. Not really. That, really. Did it prompt any soul-searching on your part? Did it, did it make you wonder about winding your neck in or... or p- no, because then they wouldn't have a name. Pa- yes, I know that, but still, we're human. No, I mean, the Guardian had already hired a security agency before that because of the levels of threat. A bunch of far-right activists had stormed the Guardian demanding to see me and so on. Um, and they said, actually, they did a review and they said the highest risk was that I would go to a pub and a bunch of far-right activists who were drunk would see me and opportunistically no, attack. That's what happened. Yeah, so I have a plan. We have, like, various things I have to do to avoid. Um, but the pandemic got in the way, actually. Of course. So, actually, that's made life safer. 
Um, but yeah, we, you know, we went, you know, and my numbers added to some data. So if I ring the police, then they, you know, and they do, when I get threats, like last week, actually, I actually felt, uh, I shared some, just some stupid abuse and made a joke out of it. Um, but someone got in touch with the police. I got woken up the next morning because the police just came round. And I was like, um, I'm fine. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't report this. <laughs> Um, Someone reported it on your behalf. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's re it's tedious. And it's tedious because I didn't just get attacked that night. My friends got punched yes. defending me. Yes. And then I think to myself, um, I'm like a liability. You know, I'm a... Well, it was true. I don't I don't remember, but it is a burden because they're going to get, you know, punched potentially or attacked or worse. Yes. And I worry about Ash Sarkar, who I love very much. Uh, she's very much a force for good. She's a great she, person. She, um, you she, worry about her because she's they're, almost... They're obsessed with her as well. Yeah. They get obsessed with her. And she's a woman of colour, Muslim, takes so many boxes they hate. So clever. Very, uh, clever than I am. Yes, I understand why. And I also understand why you, you, you would see it as somehow handing victory to the bigots if you were to moderate Definitely. your public yeah, persona well, in yeah, any course. way. Or, yeah. So... Then we come inevitably to the to the current state of of politics. As I think we've not done badly actually. Yeah, I know, life, I know. We? I, know. Got, I mean, I should mention you wrote three more books after Chabs. Most recently, two. Is, is it two? I, I, to be fair, I have. Uh, there's one I'm writing, which is now three years overdue. Okay. Most recently, this land. Oh yes, that's right. Sorry, yeah, uh, about the Corbyn period, the, yeah. about the last five years in politics, which has been a really fun ride for all involved. How do you know when to file a book like that? Because it's, <laughs> it, it, you know, you, presumably the day you sent it in, the next day something significant happened, or the next day another wrinkle appeared in the analysis. Well, actually, it was because I'd written this other book, which I've not finished, called "The Alternative and How We Build It," and that kept. I was commissioned to do that in 2015, and that's when. Donald Trump was a reality TV star. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Corbyn was still a backbencher. Um, you know, it was just, Brexit was a word most people hadn't heard of. Incredible. You know, it, it was a different universe. Isn't it? And then you keep trying to write about politics and everything changes, yeah. This book was, yeah, so my publishers actually were like, let's, it was a, it was a stepping stone to the book that I'm currently writing, which is let's just do something on this. Um, so we've kind of got it out of the way, I suppose. The risk of your child getting measles, mumps and rubella increases when they start nursery and mix with other children. We don't hear much about them anymore because most of us are vaccinated. But measles can infect 9 out of 10 unvaccinated people exposed to it and can have serious complications. Protect your child with both MMR vaccines. Contact your GP to book their first or second dose. MMR vaccines protect. Help us help you. Find out more at nhs.uk slash MMR. I mean, it's hard to know where to start in the in the. I mean, even if we had ten hours remaining rather than ten minutes, the the the, the Labour Party since Ed Miliband lost the general election has gone through a process that presumably you're as staggered by as anybody else is. Even though, in many ways, some of which you've alluded to and described today, you were much closer to the action than than most. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I mean, as a, you know, my parents met canvassing for the Labour Party. Romantic. Um, unlike, it is, actually, I think. It's not romantic. Uh, there was a snowstorm, so they went to the pub. That was more romantic. <laughs> um, no, I mean, for me, like, you know, I, I joined the Labour Party when I was 15. So yeah. Blair was leader of the Labour Party. Um, so from someone on the left, you know, I was, I was, uh, I always grew up seeing Labour as a, the, the best possible vehicle for social change, whoever's leader. So that's uh, different from other people on the left, I suppose. Mm. I'm a Labour right as well as a left winger. Yes. Yeah, so seeing yeah. the Labour Party in, in the state it's, it's in was is is tragic. I mean, I suppose what I'd say is, and this is why I think there needs to be just humility from all sides of the very uh, raucous debate. If you look at Labour sister parties across the continent, they're all, most of them in a worse state than the yeah. Labour Party are. The German Social Democrats have virtually ceased to exist. So the French Socialists. Um, and actually the parties that are in, co uh, that are in power are in coalition with more, or have done pacts with more left-wing parties because their electoral systems allow that to happen. Yeah. In this country, that can't happen, so they're, they're stuck in the same. Yeah. It's like, you know, a marriage where, um, you know, they, they prefer to divorce, but they can't afford a separate flat. Um, so they're just stuck together, <laughs> writing passive-aggressive notes on the fridge and <laughs> punching each other probably at some point. No, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, and I just think, um, you know, Obviously, the the experiment on the left 
failed us a bit, but you know. So, well, I, you are, but I, straight away, you see, I, there's a bit of me itching to say. It, I mean, it, it wasn't an experiment on the left in the sense that you describe it. It was, it was a gamble on one man. Well, I don't agree. Yeah, in this way, but by the way, I say I should be clear. I don't mean yeah. experiment on the left; it failed because it was on the left. I just mean that particular project obviously has not succeeded in what it set out to do, and I think a better, more mature response mm. for everyone involved would be to go, why didn't it succeed, but what can be salvaged? And that was supposed to be what Keir Starmer was all about, and I don't think he has stuck to that at oh. all. But in 20... 20- well, what are his most egregious diversions from that? Uh, not having any vision at oh. all. I mean, I think, you know, it's what, look, he stood in that leadership election. But should add, we're recording this... Three or four days after the Hartlepool bombing, yeah. you know, so it, it'll go out. Got, I mean, I mean I'm, no idea what. I mean, but it's probably something. I mean, you know, the phone's going mad, so presumably lots of things are currently currently detonating as is. Yeah, <laughs> he, look, I think he stood. I didn't vote for him I, because I'm on the left. I'll always vote for the left candidate. Um, so I did vote for Rebecca. I did, and I didn't think any of the candidates, to be honest with you, were people who you know. I, I look at actually the, as in, were, I, 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 all of them would have had huge problems and sure. odds stacked against them is what I mean. But of course, and I've got huge respect for Becky Long Bailey. I think she's a very talented, intelligent politician who, who, who and, and that isn't recognised enough. I think what I mean though is um, he stood saying, we're going to keep these core radical policies, but we're going to be competent and united mm. and electable. And I don't think anyone can look at Keir Starmer's leadership today and think he's ticking all those boxes at all. The reshuffle, just trying to blame a working class Northern woman uh, who wasn't in charge of the campaign and trying to scapegoat her. Yes. I feel, you know, Angie Rayner actually grew up, when I say round the corner from me, I mean literally round the corner from me. And she's someone, you know, I don't have the same politics as Angie Rayner, but I have huge respect for her. 16, you, you know, left and, school and, at 16. And, and are you getting this from the horse's mouth then? That is what you what happened? That's definitely what happened, yeah. But, and but, I mean, when I say that's what happened, that's definitely what happened. And they briefed against her. And, you know, I know that, you know, I know people in the operation very, very well. Yes and have known some of them for most of my adult life. And I just think, you know, they're not up to the job. They don't know what they want to do with political power at all. They just haven't worked it out. And they bet the house on Keir Starmer looks competent, the grown-ups are back in politics, and everything will fall into place. And that hasn't happened. And politics is harder than they expected. But also... Really? You think they were that naive? I think they were very naive. And I think this isn't, you know, the 1990s when, you know, third-way politics was in office in America yeah. and in Europe, not just here. This is a time of crisis when, you know, you do need to come up with answers. The Tories are not the Osborne Cameron Tories. They're big spending Tories. Mm. Who've, they have a vision and a project. You've got to give, you've got to have a clear vision of the country you wish to serve. And I do think we can look back at the Corbyn period and accept what went wrong, which is important to do. That's why I wrote the book I did. But mm. also to look at what did go right. And I do think in 2017, not enough to win, but the fact that that was the first time Labour put on seats since 1997, the fact that was the biggest increase in vote share since uh, 1945, the fact that was the biggest vote share since 2001, if Jamie Corbyn was seen as a legitimate Labour leader, which by and large he isn't, if he was, there would be no debate about people would say, of course we should learn from that and also learn what wasn't enough to win. So you, you, but we're not having that debate. No. And I just found that odd. And I think the vision, you know, the, the idea of let's redistribute wealth and power from the top, for the many, not the few, public ownership, scrap tuition fees, ask those at the top to pay more money in order to invest in the economy. We had Labour unable or not even backing Rishi Sunak increasing corporation tax. And I just looked at that and thought, how on earth has the Labour Party got to a position where it's to the right of the Conservatives on economic policy? That's a great point. I I don't... For me, the 2017 election was... Was was not about any of that. It was about one one thing and one thing only. But, okay, can I just say why Let's I don't do it? Bring okay, it. Bring so, it. <laughs> okay, okay. Post election polling showed that seven percent of people voted Labour because of Brexit. That was their main reason. The country had not polarised over Brexit at that time. Um, Labour went into that election promising to honour the the referendum result. And yeah, but why, people- if we look. If we look at Hartlepool as a case in point, Hartlepool in 2015 was more marginal than it was in 2019. It had a lower Labour vote than in 2019. It had more people voting UKIP than voted for the Brexit party in 2019. Because people now go, well, look at 2019, it's because of the Brexit party, that's why, they, you know, and then they all vote Tory and that. But in 20, what happened in 2017 is, in Hartlepool, which is a Leave seat, it got the biggest share of the vote and the biggest Labour majority since 2001 because a lot of those Leave voters who voted for UKIP voted for the Labour Party rather than all go and vote for the Conservatives, which is what Theresa May expected. That's why she called the election. And that's why Labour won in Peterborough, a leave seat, 
and also in the main areas like Kensington and Canterbury. And that was a time when, you know, Owen Smith, who challenged Jeremy Corbyn for Labour leader and obviously fell out very bitterly, came out and said after that election it was a manifesto on the policies and Labour MPs all said that at the time. So why... They were knocking on doors and people were saying about the policies. Why then the speed of decline in the next two years? I think two, I think two very clear reasons which were inter- interlinked and it was partly, by the way, mistakes made by Corbyn's own leadership. You, you, I, I watch you with interest on this because you were public enemy number one for some of his most ardent fans for a while. And then, I think credit to your credit enormously. You know the facts changed, and you exactly, changed, you changed yeah. Your I mean, mind. I and that that can be the most unforgivable sin of all in some well, people's maybe. eyes. My position, though, was always. I mean, people, you know, people get annoyed, obviously. But you thought he should have gone after twenty seventeen. I that? thought now you're mount, after... mounting a huge retrospective. No, 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 no. I mean, that's why it's consistent with what I say about Keir Starmer yeah. today. Because people are, oh, you didn't say this about Corbyn. I was like, I did actually. Um, I mean, look, I campaigned for Corbyn to be leader because he accorded with my left wing views. I backed him in both. You preferred him. I voted for him in both the leadership elections. But in 2017, Labour was 24 points behind the Conservatives and Labour lost the Copeland by-election. And I looked at that by-election and thought Labour's going to go into a general election, if it's called, and get smashed. Election happened, that didn't happen. And that was, in my view, because of the policies and the vision. And I was wrong. And I said I was wrong and explained why I was wrong. That doesn't mean I don't think they went on then to make mistakes. And I think part of it was, by the way, you probably won't like this, is they should have been very clearer from Brexit at the start by defining what a Labour Brexit deal would look like yeah. and... I do like ...but it. permanently close... No, but say there's never going to be a referendum. And I do think the uh, what ended up partly destroying Corbyn, in 2017 in that election, people said, might not agree with him, but he means what he says and he says what he means. And what happened with Brexit is Labour was dragged by a very successful Remain movement, which put a lot of pressure on the leadership and made existing Remain voters feel angrier about Brexit without winning over mm. any Leave voters, is make Labour dragged them to their position. But then because of that, Corbyn himself looked inauthentic. People said, well, he's not a man of principle. He doesn't have the other attributes of a leader we like, like charisma or whatever. And that is what I think, you know, as well as failures by the leadership, that in the end uh, ruined him. And actually the YouGov polling at the beginning of 2019 showed the, the majority of reason people went off Corbyn was they saw him as weak, indecisive, not making, you know, playing politics. Not necessarily. It was about the Brexit. That, well, you... It was about Brexit. People thought... It's funny, because I, I would politi- guess it was about Brexit in, in response to very different questions with just as much certainty as you say. No, I just, I just think Brexit was the only thing in politics. We weren't talking about austerity. We weren't talking about public ownership. We weren't talking about tuition it fees. It still is, Owen. Oh, do you know what? I think we should have settled, James. I do as well. I, we should have just still, had a soft still Brexit. still is. You know, it, 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 it st- I'd have voted for Theresa May's deal. I said so oh, at the right. time, simply because I was aware of what would happen if it didn't get through, and no one believed me. But that, that Well, was... we sh- I, wish, I wish we'd have done that. I wish we, I wish we'd just have settled. Uh, Theresa May's deal, in hindsight, um, would it be politically possible for Labour to have backed it? I don't think so, actually. No, nor do I. But, but they could have amended it in office. Universe. They could have done We've something. We've got the worst possible Brexit now, and I wish we just said... But I, you've also got millions of people, not just in Hartlepool, who still think it's a massive win. And I'm fascinated at, at what happens when reality becomes un... Well, I, I, I think what... Deniable. I just, I'm worried about ever relitigating Brexit. I, I think it's a massive but, error. But, but Starmer can't. This is what I find so fascinating. Though. He, d- he never tries to, and yet he's accused of it all the time. This is the well, I know, but, straight jacket in which he's But that's because himself. he hasn't offered an alternative compelling vision on for the country he seeks to lead. And I is think the if, clock ticking, or have you already... I mean, it, it, is there time for him, oh, for you, to come up with an alternative vision, or do you feel that he's damaged good? I, 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 I think he's just incapable of coming up with a vision. I don't think... Uh, I think I might agree with you. I, I mean, I just think, you know, I look at what's... Uh, you know, I think he's ended up with the worst of all worlds. He doesn't look principled. He doesn't look competent. Uh, he doesn't look um, uh, electable. Uh, he doesn't look honest. I, I just don't know what he's left with, you know? And I just think uh, he should be given some time to set up a vision. If he You're loses very, the next by election. cross about this reshuffle, aren't you? Furious, yeah, because I just think at the moment what they're doing, Peter Mandelson's back in, yeah. and Peter Mandelson just wants to crush the left and crush the unions. Uh, and I just think they'll end up waging a war against the Labour Party rather than setting up a vision that appeals to the country. Which you could argue, we've, we've 
just had a war against the Labour Party from the other end of. Well, you see what you know. What this is where I feel frustrated because yeah, no, 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 no. But that didn't happen. <laughs> well, it, kind I, of did. it, it didn't happen. And when Boris Johnson kicked out twenty-one Tory MPs, you know, and we'd had years of people going on like Corbyn's authoritarianism. No MP was deselected under Jeremy Corbyn. Not a single one he was didn't deselected. Have a mandate, did he? Well, I don't know what you mean. He just didn't deselect any MPs. I think what's coming against the left under Starmer and Mandelson, by the looks of things, is going to be infinitely worse than anything the left even dreamt up. And can you imagine they did, what they did to the deputy leader? Just humiliated and uh, humiliated her. Reasons to be cheerful? In uh, conclusion, Owen? Just... In reasons to be cheerful. <laughs> younger people. People yeah. who are genuinely young, not me, because I'm 36 now. But <laughs> younger people, I think... They're the ones who are going to change the world, and I think they're. they're it's a lot arguing. of pressure. Catley Moran's written very powerfully about why this is not doing them any favours. Laying this, they've got enough going I know on these you. kids, and then you say, so "Don't worry, you're going to save the they world are. as well." They're going to save the world, though. <laughs> they, no pressure, younger people. They but look at the world very, very differently. So different, and yeah. on everything from you know, you know, on social issues, they're so progressive. But on things like climate justice, you know, and they're having such, they've had such a terrible time over the last few years. Got yeah. really hammered since the crash. They're going to save us. Owen Jones, thank you. It's a pleasure. Always is. A massive pleasure.